Hi. In this video, we'll be learning about cryptography. Now, cryptography is the practice of encrypting secret information so that it stays secret. Now, why would we need that? Why do we need to keep information secret? Well, the internet is an open place. When you're sending digital information over the internet, those bits, those zeros and ones can be read by anyone. Yet, we're sharing a lot of really sensitive information over the internet. We're sharing our credit card information, health records, passwords, bank accounts, private messages, all of this information can be picked up by someone who's listening. So we need a way to keep this information secret when we're sending it over the internet. This is where cryptography comes in. So cryptography is scrambling digital information into an unreadable form. That way, only those with verified authority, such as a password or a secret key, can unscramble it to read the original information. It's scrambling those zeros and ones such that even if someone were able to access that data, they wouldn't be able to read it because they don't have the proper authority. They don't have the password or the key. So there's some terminology here. Scrambling that digital information, mixing up the zeros and ones, that is encrypting. And unscrambling it back into its original form is decrypting. So in general, this is how encryption works. We have our data that we want to keep secret and then we have our key. And the key is usually just random gobbledygook. It's just a random sequence that's unique of characters and numbers. Now when that is encoded as zeros and ones, we can put those together into an encrypt function. And the encrypt function does mathematical operations on both the data and the key to produce a scrambled version of the data that is a product of both the data and the key. So the result is an encrypted message. And if someone is listening and they pick up these zeros and ones, if they try to read it, it's just going to look like nonsense. There's no way to connect that back to the original data. The encrypt function has scrambled it according to the key. Then if we have that encrypted message and we have the exact same key, we can put that into a decrypt function, a decryption algorithm, and the result will be a decrypted message that is the original message. What's important is the only way to decrypt the message is by sending the correct key into the decrypt function. If we try to decrypt with the wrong key, we won't get the proper message. We'll, again, we'll get nonsense. So there's two things, the data and the key. The encryption and the decryption need a key. So cryptography is a pretty old idea. For a long time, humans have had the need to keep information secret even when they're sending it long distances. One of the first examples of cryptography was in ancient Rome with Julius Caesar. So Julius Caesar came up with what is known as the Caesar cipher, and it was used by Julius Caesar to send secret messages to his Roman army. He would encrypt these messages, and that way, even if the messages were intercepted by the enemy, the enemy wouldn't be able to understand it. They wouldn't be able to read it. Now, how the Caesar cipher works is you shift each letter of the message by a certain amount, and this amount is called the key. So for example, if we had a key of one, a would be shifted to become B. B would be shifted to become C. Everything gets shifted down one. At the very end, there's nothing after Z, so Z wraps around and becomes A. So this is the Caesar cipher. This is the algorithm for Caesar cipher. For example, say we had a key of three. If I wanted to encrypt the message, attack tonight, I'm trying to send that to my general, but I can't let the enemy know, I will encrypt this message with a Caesar cipher and a key of three. So A will be shifted down 3 to become B, C, D, A will become D, T will become U, V, W, and so on. And the result is this. Now even if the enemy picks this up, they won't be able to make sense of this. Once my general receives it, they will decrypt by shifting the opposite direction with the exact same key. Then they will understand the message. So in this scenario, both Julius Caesar and the general need to agree on a key. The same key is used for encrypting as for decrypting. So in code, it could look something like this. We have our message, attack tonight, we have our key of three, and the secret message is going to be the result of a function call to encrypt where we pass both the message and the key. Now this is the algorithm. This is the important part of the encryption. It's taking the data that we want to encrypt, it's taking the key to encrypt it with, and it returns a nonsensical message such as DWW, DFN, etc. But there are many encryption algorithms besides the Caesar cipher. This encrypt function could be doing one of many things. It could be doing the RSA algorithm, it could be doing the Schaff's algorithm. It doesn't really matter what's going on. The result is that it is an encrypted message that is a product of the original data and the key. Now there are some problems with the Caesar cipher. One problem is that it can only encrypt alphabetic data. 
But a lot of times we need to encrypt images, we need to encrypt numbers, etc. Now the other problem is that it's very easy to crack. If an enemy were to pick up the message and they knew it was encrypted with a Caesar cipher, there's only 26 letters in the alphabet. So there's only 26 possible keys they would have to try before decrypting the message. But that's ancient cryptography. What about today's cryptography? Well, it's actually very similar to the Caesar cipher. We're still encrypting data according to a key. The idea of passing it to a function, encrypt, that produces an encrypted message that's a product of the data and the key still applies. It's just that what's going on inside that encrypt function has a much more complicated mathematical basis. And that's how it's different from the Caesar cipher. The math behind the scenes is much more complicated than simply shift down the alphabet. Also, the key is much larger. Rather than using a key between 1 and 26, we're using massive, massive keys that can take on trillions of trillions of trillions of values. So the unfortunate thing is, no matter how strong our encryption is, there will always be someone who's trying to crack the encryption. You might hear them called hackers or attackers or cyber criminals, but there are people who are looking to crack encrypted data and get the secrets inside. And this is called cracking the encryption. So no matter what the encryption is, if an attacker is able to try every possible key, then they will eventually be able to decrypt the message. And this is where the problem is with Caesar Cipher. There's only 26 possible keys. So if the attacker has a computer, that will take under a second to try every possible key. So we need to beef up our keys a little bit. Not too long ago, we used 40-bit keys for standard encryption. Since the key has 40 bits, that means there's 2 to the 40th, or about 1 trillion possible values. There's over 1 trillion possible keys. We thought that was enough, but as computers got faster and faster, even this wasn't enough. These days, a computer could guess a trillion different keys very quickly. That's why today, the keys we use for encryption are at least 256 bits. That's 2 to the 256, or that many, possible keys. With today's computing power, that number would take trillions of trillions of years to try every possible key. Now, cracking an encryption brings up the idea of the computability of problems. So when it comes to computers, there's actually hard and easy problems to solve. It turns out some problems aren't solvable at all. The goal here is we want encryption to be computationally hard to crack. Trying every possible key should be a hard problem to solve. Now, what do I mean when I say hard versus easy problems? Well, it turns out computers can't solve everything, and some things are a lot harder for computers to solve than others. So some things are very easy for computers to solve. An easy problem is a problem where, as the input gets bigger, the time it takes to solve the problem increases at a reasonable rate along with the input. For example, finding the smallest element in an array. If we have an array of four values, and we want to find the smallest element, we can do that pretty quickly. And if the array increases by one, then we only need to look at one more element. That's not that big of an increase. That's, that doesn't take that much more time to solve the problem as the input increases. It's increasing at a reasonable rate. But a hard problem is such that as the input gets bigger, the time it takes to solve increases at an exponential rate. That way, the input gets bigger, and pretty soon we have a problem that is way too big for a computer to solve. For example, trying every possible key for a given key size. So if we have a two-bit key, that's two to the second or four possible keys. If we increase the bit only once to have three bits, we now have eight possible keys. So when the key size gets one bit bigger, the number of keys that we have to try doubles. It doesn't get bigger by one, it doubles. So if we keep doing this, we get an exponential increase. It doubles, it doubles, it doubles. Pretty soon we have a problem that's too big to solve. So as the number of bits in keys increases, the possible keys to try exponentially increases. This is what makes cracking and encryption a hard problem. Let's take the 40-bit versus 256-bit key size as an example. 256 bits is about six times as big as 40 bits, so the input size has increased by six times. However, the number of 256-bit keys is not six times as big as the number of 40-bit keys. It's two to the 216 times as big. So with a tiny increase in the input, the search space just became massive number of things we have to try has gotten much bigger even though the input hasn't increased that much. So with a 40-bit key, we have 2 to the 40 or about 1 trillion possible keys. With a 256-bit key, we have 2 to the 256 or 115 undecillion possible keys. And that's, that's insane. That's so much bigger than 2 to the 40th. So 
cracking an encryption is a hard problem to computationally solve. This is because computers cannot try every possible key in a reasonable amount of time. It'll take trillions of years. Even if computers get faster like they have been, they've been doubling in speed and getting twice as small every year, this doesn't matter because all we have to do is increase the key size a little bit and the time it takes to solve increases exponentially. Now, there are two types of encryption. There is symmetric encryption, where the same key is used for both encryption and decryption. Then there is asymmetric encryption. And in asymmetric, one key encrypts and then a different key decrypts. So let's see an example of symmetric key encryption. Suppose we have two people, Alice and Bob. And they have met in private and agreed on a shared private key. So they both take a copy of this key with them. Now they are able to use this key to send encrypted messages to each other. They have a copy of the same key. So now Alice wants to send a secret message to Bob. What Alice does is she encrypts the message with her secret key. And now it's locked. Now if someone picks it up, it's all scrambled. It's not going to be readable. She can send it over to Bob, trusting that no one else along the way will be able to understand it because they don't have the key. And now Bob decrypts the message with his key, and he's able to read the message. Now, this only worked because they were able to share this key. They met up in private and were able to make copies of this shared key. And this presents a problem for encrypted communication on the internet. There are billions of devices on the internet, and computers can't really meet in private to agree on a shared key. It's not reasonable to think that every computer will have billions of private keys that it's sharing with billions of other computers. So we need a different system. This is where asymmetric encryption comes in. So the solution is public key encryption, which is a form of asymmetric encryption. So with public key encryption, there is one key that encrypts the information, and there is a different key, and only this different key is able to decrypt the information. So in this system, everybody has a public key and a private key. So Alice has her own public key and her own private key. Bob has his own public key and his own private key. Now the public key encrypts the data and the private key decrypts the data. So the way this works is you share your public key with the world. It's fine, it's public, anyone can take it. It's not gonna be able to decrypt anything, it can only encrypt. But you must keep your private key secret because the private key is what decrypts all the messages. So Alice wants to send a message to Bob. What she'll do is she'll ask Bob for his public key and he'll send it on over, he'll send a copy. That's fine, it's a public key, anyone can get a copy of it, it's public. Once she has the public key, Alice will encrypt the message with Bob's public key. Now that it's encrypted, the only thing that can decrypt it is Bob's private key. So now she'll send it over the network, she'll send it out to Bob, she'll send it encrypted with Bob's public key. And even if attackers have Bob's public key, which they probably do because it's public, it's open, available to the public, they can't open the message because the public key doesn't do them any good. It's only the private key that is able to decrypt the message. So she can send it over the network, confident that no one will be able to read it until it gets to Bob. Now Bob receives the message, he is able to decrypt it with his private key, and then he'll be able to read it. What's nice is Bob can send a message to Alice with the exact same process. Bob will ask Alice for her public key, Bob will encrypt the message with her public key, send it back, and then Alice will decrypt it with her private key. So this is the form of encryption that is used on the internet because it's so much more scalable, it's so much more reasonable for all computers to be using this system.